So I would like to begin with an image. This image is something that many of us picture when we think about the global refugee crisis. People desperately fleeing violence in countries like Syria or South Sudan, making treacherous, sometimes deadly journeys, risking everything just, just to wash up on our shores. Not in my backyard, some of us might think to ourselves or even say out loud. So much of the discussion of the ongoing refugee crisis in Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic societies, or what some people call weird places, so much of the discussion around the refugee crisis in weird places revolves around concerns that many of us have with these images. How are we going to accommodate all of these people? What's going to happen to labor markets or crime or the already insane housing market? Now, don't get me wrong, these are all reasonable questions, and I, I wish I had the answers to them. But in asking and answering these questions, what we fail to understand is that actually, most refugees are not going to weird places. In fact, 84% of all refugees are actually hosted in countries that are immediately adjacent, adjacent to the ones that they've left. And many times, these countries are as poor or poorer than the places that people are fleeing. On top of it, most refugees end up in large city-like camps, and they stay for a very long time. Currently, the UNHCR estimates that 41% of all refugees live in a refugee camp that has been in existence for more than five years. And many of these camps are quite large. The, U the UNHCR counts seven camps currently that are hosting populations over 80,000 people, and a further 19 with populations between 40 and 80,000. So what are the effects of hosting refugees in these kinds of settings? What I would like to convince you of this evening is that it is crucial for us to understand the impact of hosting refugees on the regions that are most commonly hosting them. For one, the refugee crisis is not going to end anytime soon. There are currently 65.6 million people who have been internally displaced from their homes, and 22.5 of them are refugees. Let's pause to think about that number, 22.5 million people. This is slightly less than the population of Australia. And half of these people, half of these refugees, are under the age of 18. So the refugee problem is not going away. But more importantly, I argue that it is crucial for us to understand and promote refugee integration in local settings because it, ha because it has the potential to bring many benefits. And in particular, it has the potential to reduce these precarious migration flows that we so frequently observe in the media and fear. So why don't we understand these impacts already? Well, the problem is that empirically measuring these effects is actually quite difficult. And the main reason for this is because refugees relocate to data-scarce regions. What I mean by data scarcity is that they go to areas that are marginalized themselves and often don't have good administrative or census data that we can use to ask and answer these questions over time. So we've been very limited in what we can do until recently. In 2015, I had the opportunity to join a team of researchers from the World Bank, from the University of Wisconsin, where I was a graduate student, and our very own Anne Bartlett in the School of Humanities here at UNSW, to conduct a study on the economic impacts of hosting refugees in northwestern Kenya. So this particular region of Kenya is called Turkana and is home to the Turkana people, who are a group of semi-nomadic pastoralists that are largely unengaged with the formal economy. Turkana shares a border with South Sudan, Ethiopia, and Uganda, and has been hosting refugees for over 25 years. It's also historically one of the poorest places in Kenya. Kakuma, meaning nowhere in Swahili, the national language of Kenya, is the main refugee camp located in Turkana. The camp was established in 1992 when 7,000 Sudanese lost boys walked from South Sudan into Kenya, having first fled violence in their home countries and then refugee camps in Ethiopia. 
At the time that the Lost Boys arrived, Kakuma Town had a population of just under 6,000 people. And today, the refugee camp is home to over 180,000 refugees. So how has Kakuma been affected by hosting refugees for over two decades? Well, before we even collected any data, it was very apparent to us, just from walking in and around the refugee camp, that there was a lot of integration between refugees and Turkana people. Today, Kakuma is essentially a city where there are market centers and hospitals and schools that refugees and host community can use. This photograph illustrates the oldest main market center in the refugee camp known as Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, you can access many goods and services, and you can get some of the best Ethiopian food in all of Kenya. In fact, I even had a few dresses made for myself when I was in the refugee camp by a Congolese refugee who had started a tailoring business inside of the camp. And many times, our research staff would meet at Franco's hotel to share a meal and discuss the progress of our research. But qualitative observations aside, we were still tasked with the mission of measuring the economic effects of these refugee inflows on the local community. So to start answering our questions, we conducted over 500 household surveys with both refugee and Turkana households, asking basic questions about household demographics, health, consumption patterns, assets, access to important services like hospitals and schools. And while this was very detailed information, it could only give us a snapshot of what life was like in 2015. What it couldn't tell us was what were the long-run effects. In order to answer this question, we would need data going back to at least 1992, which just simply didn't exist in Turkana. So to overcome this empirical barrier, we relied on data which classifies the intensity of nighttime lights as captured by NASA, light, or NASA satellite imagery. So this picture is a map of the nighttime lights, and maybe, I don't know, Solange's students, maybe they were responsible for taking this picture. And many of you are maybe wondering, what in the world does NASA have to do with refugees? And in fact, more than you would initially think. As you can see from this map, the places where the lights are the brightest are also places where there's a lot of economic activity. And in fact, many economists and data scientists have spent a lot of time justifying and showing that these lights are correlated with, with accepted measures of economic activity like GDP. And for the purposes of our work, the data go back to 1992. So this was great. So what did we find? We, using the nighttime lights data, we found a very strong positive correlation between refugee inflows and economic activity. So specifically what we found is with a 10% increase in the refugee population, meaning you add an additional 6,000 refugees, economic activity increases by 3.6%. And when we correlate this with our very detailed information on consumption, we find that this corresponds to a 5.5% in, in percent increase in consumption. So for a place like Turkana, which is one of the poorest places in Kenya, these are very meaningful effects. And when we look at the channels through which we could find these positive effects, what we see is that Turkana households who live within a 10-kilometer radius of the camp, they are less likely to be herding cattle and more likely to be engaged in the formal economy, meaning that they're working in low-skilled jobs and they're earning wages, especially if they have a secondary education. And for the households who remain herding cattle, they're receiving higher prices for the meat that they sell and for the agricultural products that they produce as a result of increased demand from refugees. So where do we go from here? Our work shows some of the first empirical evidence that long-run refugee inflows can generate positive benefits. But we should recognize that northern Kenya is a specific context. It is representative of some refugee environments, but particularly the host community being uh, an inf having an informal economy prior to the refugees arriving is a unique setting. 
Nonetheless, we can show that refugees do provide, and it's important to recognize that refugees do provide meaningful economic benefits to local communities. And we should be designing policies that can amplify these effects. So for instance, in the case of Kakuma, we could think of interventions that support locals' ability to exploit the increased demand from refugees. So this could come in the form of technical support for livestock or agricultural produ production, or we could provide vocational training to Turkana households to equip them with the skills they would need to take advantage of this new wage work. So while Kakuma is a specific case, it's a very important case. And I hope that the drop in the bucket that our research has made inspires others to conduct similar work in other regions, such as the Syrian diaspora to Turkey and Lebanon and Jordan, or the ongoing Rohingya diaspora in Bangladesh. Together, perhaps we can change the cry of not in my backyard to a yes. Thank you. <laughs>